welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I love the fact that you come in the house of God, find out something about God, find out something about you. Each time you do, you, I'm telling you, you're going to get blessed. God's going to bless you, and I'll prove it to you tonight by the word of the Lord. Tonight, the message, dare to be dedicated. The word dedicated came out of Luke's conversation. Pastor Luke this morning, it just went off yesterday and today. About how we're going to do anything in life, you're going to have to be dedicated to it. Now listen to what I'm going to say. I don't care who you are, what business you're in, you'll never be successful until you're dedicated. I don't care how many children you have or how many times you should take them to Disneyland and feed them or play in the park or go to their sports games. You'll never be successful until you're dedicated. I don't care who you are. You won't finish school. You won't do your job well. You won't become a good wife or a husband. You won't do anything until you're dedicated. And it's the exact same thing in a relationship with God. In order to be the person that God would have you to be and receive the blessings that God desires to give to you. Man, I tell you what, you got to be dedicated. And a lot of times we don't realize that that word dedication is a powerful word that means a lot to God. Sometimes you can find it in the scripture and the word consecration. We've talked about that before, but let's just use the simple word of dedication. In the Jewish feasts, one of the feasts were the Feast of Dedication. Once a year it took place, ninth month of the Jewish calendar on the 25th day. In case you didn't know that, the ninth month and 25th day of the Jewish calendar is December 25th. And what the dedication was, wasn't, I would have thought, was a reminder of the people about their dedication every year towards the things of the Lord, but it wasn't. It's really interesting. It was a dedication feast that all of Israel got together and had for a purpose. And it was because the temple was cleansed after the pollution of evil that had been in the temple. And it was a celebration of the temple being cleansed. And right after the temple was cleansed, then they started annually this celebration called the Feast, if you will, of Dedication. That was once a year. Now stop and think about it. You today, the similitude there, symbolically is saying something in the Old Testament, the New Testament. The New Testament is you're the temple and when there is a consecration, excuse me, a a, a restoration, a healing, when the temple is cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, after the cleansing of the temple comes, if you will, dedication time consecration time. That's the way it is. If you're going to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, be born again, headed for heaven. You don't just stop, do nothing afterwards. You've got to be dedicated. I found that the level of dedication that you have and I have is measured by how responsive we are, of course, to the things of the Lord, like Luke was saying this morning. But also the level of dedication that we have brings forth the blessings of the Lord. If I wasn't dedicated to the word of God and Deborah wasn't dedicated to the word of God, we would not have made it for 34 years and be on our 35th year right now and been happy during those 34, 35 years. I mean, that's, I mean, staying married is one thing. Being happy and more in love after 35 years. Now, that's something to talk about. You say, well, what did she do? She did the word. What did I do? I did the word the very best I could. But if I didn't know what to do to apply it to the marriage, it wouldn't work. I was dedicated in order to have a great marriage. I'd had lousy marriages before, as you all know. I'd been married three times before I was 25 years old. Like, what's that all about? Failed three times. Got dumped three times. 
I wasn't about to look at marriage and, and say, wow, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. I didn't know what I was doing. The only way marriage is going to work is my dedication to the Word of God. And dedication to the Word of God brings the blessings of the Lord, which you heard speak this morning. Mm, interesting. Dare to be dedicated. When dedication becomes real is what we're going to be talking about. There's some things in order for any dedication, whether it be towards your business or marriage, your job, your commitment, wife, husband, whatever it is, any dedication you're going to make. There are a few things that you just have to start out with in order for that dedication not to be just lip action, but to really be something that is real and produces the fruit of the Lord. These areas of our life, sometimes we overlook them. So I'm going to give you some insight. We're going to compartmentalize those thoughts, put them into one, two, and three so you can easily see them, and then start functioning in them yourself. Each one is going to start with one word, and then I'll explain what it means. When dedication becomes real, here's number one. The word follow is a great word which means when you finally dedicated yourself to follow the living God and his ways. Not just somebody who says they're a Christian, not just somebody who comes to church once in a while, not just somebody who says bedtime prayers. And that's the extent of your relationship with God. Not just somebody who claims Jesus as their Savior, but someone who literally follows the Lord. And when you and I follow the Lord, and we are dedicated to the following of what? Follow means he's out in front. What he does and where he goes, I'm going. What he says, I'm doing. Just like Jesus says, when you see me, you see the Father. He was following the Father. They said, Jesus, show us the Father. When you hear my words, it's the words of the Father who sent me. Following is a great, a great thing. I want to give you a little story about some tribes, if you will, that are about ready to go into the promised land. You remember the promised land, how the Egyptians, the tribes of Israel came out, if you will, out of Egypt, and God was leading them to the promised land. And remember he had the 10 spies that go out, the 12 spies that go out, 10 came back and with an evil report and turned all of the heart of Israel so that none of them went into the promised land. There was only two that came back, Joshua and Caleb, with a good report, but didn't, nevertheless they couldn't turn and sway the multitudes. So 40 years has to go by. Any here, Here's what happened. Any if you will, adult male that was 20 years old and older had to die off for the next generation to come up and follow God into the promised land. Really fascinating. Now there's at this time, I'm going to take you there in the book of Numbers if you want to turn there because we're talking about following the Lord. You're going to be dedicated, you're going to have to be dedicated to following God. And there's this time when they're about ready to go into the promised land and um, there's a couple of tribes. One is Reuben and one is Gad. And they are noted for their livestock. These guys are like ranchers. They've got a lot of livestock. And they see the land east of the Jordan. And they say, what in the world do we want to go over the Jordan for? into the promised land, this is where we should be with all of our livestock. They'll be fed, they'll get fat, we'll get rich, this is wonderful. I'm sure Moses will understand. Now remember, Moses doesn't go into the promised land, he dies before he gets in. And Joshua takes him into the promised land, so obviously they go to Moses and Eleazar the priest, and they start to talk to Moses and Eleazar, and they say, look, you guys go into the promised land. We're going to stay on this side of the Jordan because there's grass for our, our animals. And, they're gonna, and if you really love us, you'll let us go. And you guys go. Moses flips out. He says, are you kidding? 
We're not going to battle without you. That's what you did last time, 40 years ago. Your fathers were some of those that turned the tribes and everybody had to die because you wouldn't follow the Lord then. Now you're not going to follow the Lord now. And if you don't follow the Lord now, you're going to have problems. And you're going to curse yourself. And, they, and, they, and they're just like stopped in their tracks. They really thought Moses would let them stay there. So they come up with this plan and they say to Moses, Moses, all of our warriors, not any, not just a few, all of our warriors will suit up for battle. We'll go across the Jordan with you into the promised land and we'll fight. Just leave our, our, our herds here and leave our shepherds here to watch the herds. And then after everybody's settled, We'll come back. And Moses says, listen, when everybody's settled in the land and the battles are over with and the Lord's done what he wants, then you can come back. And not until then can you come back to your families and your herds. Interesting. We're talking about following. And then Moses starts to talk to them about what their fathers did and didn't do. And he starts to tell them the story. And in telling them the story, he makes a statement that you and I need to see about if you're going to really take your dedication and make it real, you're going to have to really make a commitment to follow the Lord. Now watch this. Watch this. Let's take a look. Numbers, if you will. And when you get to Numbers, go to the way back, the 32nd chapter. The 32nd chapter of Numbers, and we'll start in verse number 11. Remember, Moses is now talking to these guys who want to stay on the east of the Jordan and not go in for battle. And he's explaining to them about how it is. But the statement that I want to get to is what Moses says about Caleb and what Moses says about Joshua, who were those people who really wanted to go to the promised land 40 years earlier. Watch this. Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt Verse number 11, surely none of the men that came up from Egypt from 20 years old and above shall see the land for which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they have not wholly followed me. First thing you got to have to understand is you cannot follow God without wholly following God. This is not a follow God on Sunday and forget about him on Monday dedication and dedicated to the things of God if you're going to follow God is not something you just do once in a while or for a while it means for the rest of your life it's not like I could go to Deborah and say you know what I want you to know I'm dedicated to you for a month or two or until you do things the way uh, uh, as long as you do things the way I think you ought to do them but the moment that you don't do things the way I like you to do them, I'm out of here and when you're dedicated, you're dedicated to follow God wholly. And that's one of the things that we don't see very often in the church. We'll follow God for a while, but we won't follow God to the end. Is anybody listening? And when you make a dedication of something, you are dedicated until God releases you from that dedication. Because they have not wholly followed me. But verse number 12 comes along. Watch this. Except Caleb, the son of Jephani and, 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 and uh, Kenazite, and, and Joshua, the son of Nun. For they have wholly followed the Lord. You're talking about dedication. Dedication comes when you follow God completely to even to the end. You know, a lot of times we're caught up in our own traps. Here's our trap we get going, we get blessed. And we get so far, and then we stop with God. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. I have seen over the years of pastoring so many people who have come along and they have nothing. Get into God, start to get blessed, get a little bit, not even a, a lot, just a little bit of blessing, and then turn right back from their dedication. Turn right back to the, like the, the dog eating his vomit, right back to the pig uh, in the trough, instead of going on until the end, going on to God. This is not a dedication for a little while. This is not a dedication when things are good. This is a dedication when things are good, bad, indifferent. Doesn't matter if there's giants in the land or not giants in the land. We've got to wholly follow God. 
And so many times, one of the traps of the devil is to get you comfortable, allow you to get comfortable, allow you to have enough so that you're comfortable instead of going as far as you need to go. And God wants us to finish this race that we finish it in a good fight of faith and we finish with the joy of the Lord. We don't just come along or dedicate it until things get good. Things are going to get good the closer you get to God. But guess what? That's not how you stop. That's the beginning of great things God wants to do for you. I can't tell you how many people in my life would come to me and give me a testimony. Pastor, I got saved about six months ago, and God's doing such amazing things. And I'll look at them, and here's my words I'll say to them. It's just the beginning. The reason I say that is because I want them to get a picture. Listen, what God has done now that's even satisfying to you is not even anywhere near what God can do. Don't stop now. Keep on going. And that's holy following God. There's so many people that come along and they follow God until they're fairly comfortable and then back off of God and change the plans, what got them fairly comfortable in the first place. Then you meet them down the road five or six, eight, ten years later and they're miserable, divorced, their marriages don't work, their kids aren't serving God, they just hate each other, they hate people, their business is lousy and they're broke down, busted and disgusted. And I want you to know something, God doesn't want you that way. And it all comes back to making a dedication to simply follow wholehearted. And when you follow, it's a commitment to the end. Come on, somebody. We're talking about when dedication becomes real. Number one, follow wholehearted to the end. Number two, listen to this. When dedication becomes real, here it is. I'm going to use one word, remove. You will never have a dedication to the end until you remove the obstacles that will keep you from that dedication. Well, let me say it again. You don't like it. I can tell you. You will never have a dedication to the end until you remove the obstacles that will keep you from the dedication. One more time. You will never have a dedication to the end until you remove the obstacles That'll keep you from that dedication. Because there's lots of stuff we live with in life we don't deal with. And what you don't deal with will rise its ugly head that's ungodly later on down the road and knock you off track to the place where you're mad at God and you give up on God. And that's why the church has such an amazing amount of turnovers because people are stupid and don't realize that this is not just a commitment to follow God wholeheartedly. We've got to get rid of some of the problems that keep us from running this race. Is anybody listening? If you don't deal with the issues... The issues will deal with you. You ever ever seen a crabby old grumpy old man? I mean, some of you have movies, grumpy old man movies, you know? And he's just crabby and as grumpy as can possibly be. The reason for it is little issues became big issues as you get older. Because you didn't deal with them. Some of you got old parents that are just... You know, just aggravated, ugly all the time, crabby, don't want you around, make comments that hurt your heart, do all that kind of, you know what I'm talking about. How'd they get that way? Issues that were little in their life when they were young were never dealt with by Jesus Christ. They just lived with them. You've got to remove the obstacles that keeps you from your dedication. In other words, you've got to get to the place where you know how to handle the problems in your life. I was back there wanting to slap somebody. I was watching these people. I'm telling you, these are adults. They were messing around during the altar call. They were disturbing a 20 purple radius. I'm, I'm telling you, I just wanted to walk down the aisle, look at them. I actually saw people get up in the middle of the altar call and try to talk to me. I am the wrong person to talk to in the middle of an all. How many times you been in this church? I, you do not want to talk to me in the middle of an altar call. That's the most sacred time you don't move. God wants to touch lives, people's eternal lives at stake, and you want to go into a conversation? See, I, it's like, and then God got a hold of my issue. My issue is I can, I'm explosive. I don't know if it's, some people say, oh, it's righteous anger. I hope it is. 
To me, it feels like sin because I want to knock them out. You know what I mean? But I don't knock them out because I know how to deal with the issue. I may be a little mouthy. I may be in someone's face. Maybe they need to have somebody in their face. Maybe we need to have a tough pastor that says, man, we got lives at stake. This is not just a game. If you want a spiritual game, go back to the church you came from. They'll play the game with you. So you can bring your tithes and offerings as they sprinkle you with whatever and blow smoke all over you. So don't tell me that. But if you want to go on with God, this is a serious move of the Holy Spirit, not of a man, of the Holy Spirit talking to the people. And sometimes I really believe inside of me, it's righteous, it's righteous anger like Jesus with a whip when he saw the people being distracted and being taken advantage of and people in the temple that were doing wrong. Jesus angered, didn't he? But he didn't sin. I didn't sin, why? Because I got control of that issue in my life. Now, when I played professional baseball, that was different. I was 18 years old. You don't know this, but I was sent home because of my temper. I, there was a fight in the field. I was in the middle of the fight. I was up in the stands sometimes. People in the stands were pretty bad. You know, this was in the 60s. We had LA riots. My roommate was a black guy, Jimmy Owens. And, my, and I loved Jimmy, and Jimmy loved me. We were f best friends. And the things that people would say, now we were playing ball in the South. It was like crazy, man. I had to go to a restaurant, get food for Jimmy, because they wouldn't let him in the restaurant. But they'd come and watch him, and then call him names, even take out a gun one time trying to shoot him, because he was black. Let me tell you something. When a fight broke out in the field, I went after those people. And man, I got sent home after four years. They said, look, we can't deal with you. But I had to learn. And I married this woman called Deborah. And she said, look, I'm not putting up with your temper. You got an ungodly temper. I said, I do? <laughs> she said, yeah, you got an ungodly temper. You got to deal with it with the things of God. Because I'm not going to put up with that. I said, okay, show me how. She helped me to deal with it. Let me tell you something. I still get fired up. Thank God I get fired up, but, I, but I'm not in sin. I can get angry, but not sin. That's what Jesus did, but I had to learn how to deal with the issue. If you have an issue that's keeping you from your dedication, you got to get rid of the obstacles. Is anybody listening? I'm going to take you to the, to the Old Testament again. While you're already in the Old Testament, let me, let me just take you to 2 Kings. Here's a king by the name of Josiah really good king but he comes in his family's all messed up and he has to clean up their act and so what he does is he comes in and he cleans up stuff and he becomes a good king over Judah now for those of you who don't understand that when you read your Bible it says Israel sometimes it says Judah it's all the children of Israel the two southern tribes if you will of Benjamin and Judah they were they were the two southern tribes and they're called Judah they occasionally had a good king the 10 northern tribes if you will never had any good king they were called Israel so here's a good king his name is Josiah he comes in and he cleans the house from his family and his relatives let me read it to you it's so interesting for you to see uh, 2 Kings 23 when you get to 2 Kings 23, let's take a look at it together. Is anybody listening? We're talking about removing those obstacles that are in your path that'll keep you from doing what God would have you to do in your dedication. In 2 Kings 23, and let's take a look at back to verse 24. Here's Josiah coming in, if you will, into the, his, his strength and his, and his leadership. And verse number 24, it says, Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritualists, the household gods and idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, and he might, so that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book. Wait a minute. You got to get this. Here's Josiah. Can I take it back to A again? Here's Josiah. Put away. 
In other words, he's getting rid of some stuff. Let me tell you something. Some of you guys in here and some of you gals in here got to start putting away some stuff in order for you to go to the next level with God. You say, how do I do that? You do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. God gave you the Holy Spirit. It gives you the power over the flesh, over your feelings, over your thinking so you can do what God says. Secondly, you've got to learn the Word of God so you know what's right and what isn't right. In other words, you'll think your feelings are right and, and instead of doing it. But listen to what he says. He puts away those things, consulting mediums and spiritualists and household gods and idols. They had all kinds of junk in their house. All the abominations that were seen in the land of Jerusalem. Now go to beef with me and watch this. That he, and I should have underlined, I should have highlighted this, that he might perform the words of the law. In other words, got to get rid of the stuff in order to do the things God would have you to do. You can't just babysit the stuff and expect it just to go away. God's word makes it in order to perform Notice this, and he might perform the word of the Lord which was written in the books. And he says, and the priest found in the house of, of, of the Lord. Verse number 25. Now before him there was no king like him who, who, tur who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul. And he might follow according to the, law, to the law of Moses. Nor after him did any arise like him. He was special. All he did was get rid of the stuff so he could do the things of God. Let me say it again. All he did in order to stay dedicated was get rid of the stuff so he could do the word of God. What's my job? Get rid of the stuff that keeps me from the word of God. The anger, the frustration, the guilt, uh, whatever it might be, the anxiety, the, the doubting, the judging, the criticisms, uh, whatever it might possibly be that you are dealing with, whatever situation that was ungodly, counter the ways of God, so that you do the word of God, so you keep that dedication, because either you're going to get rid of that stuff, or it's going to get rid of you. New Testament in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number one. And I'll just pop that up on the overhead for you because it says, Therefore, we also, since be surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So he comes along and he makes this statement, let us set it aside. We're going to have to get rid of this in order to run a race. You cannot run your race. You'll never have a depth of, listen, dedication until you get rid of some of the issues that keep you from the things of God. You're never going to have the things that keep you from the things of God and the stuff of God. You're going to have to make a choice. Just going to have to make a choice. There was a times when I had to make choices. I still to this day have to make a choice. Am I going to do God or am I going to do myself? Am I going to do it my way or do it God's way? It's the way it is. And I had to get rid of this stuff in order to do the word of God. So the wonderful word that we have there is a word called remove. We're talking about when dedication becomes real. Number one, follow. Whole heart, committed God. Don't just talk, but follow. Number two, in order to follow, we're going to have to remove those obstacles that keep us from our dedication. And here's the last one for tonight. Can I just give you one more quick one? Because we're talking about dare to be dedicated. And so we look at number three. Number three is really kind of cool. It's one of my favorites, rejoice. Make your dedication your joy. I mean, if you're dedicated to your wife, you know what I found? I, I, I found myself nuts about her. I have said all my life, I love the woman. I love that woman. She, can I just tell you something? I said this to the other day to a young couple that were having trouble. I said, look, when his problems become your pleasure, your marriage will get in line. And I said, when her problems become your joy, something you love instead of something you criticize, your marriage becomes supernatural. 
All of a sudden, Jesus sees me in my problems, and he loves me. He doesn't agree with my problems. He's not in, you know, acceptance and approval of my problems, but he never stopped loving me. And I have to tell you, the Bible says that he was joyful when he looked at me on the cross, because the Bible says Isaiah that he saw us on the cross. And for that reason, he was joyful. And I want you to know, until you make the problems, trials and pressures, and especially the dedications, joyful. Now let me say this to you. A lot of people make dedications and they think of the dedications as commitments of pain, something you're going through. I was telling Deborah the other day, on a fast, I said, you get hungry. The neat thing about it is you never lose weight until you're hungry. Hunger pains are actually saying something to you. You know what they're saying? They're not saying I'm hungry. They're saying you're losing weight. Hunger pain says you're losing weight. You never lose weight until you're hungry. So what do we do? We nibble all day long trying to get rid of the hunger. Until you get to the place where you can rejoice in your dedication instead of making your dedication a problem, what happens is the dedication never comes to its fullness. And you and I have got to, when we make a dedication to God, see it as something good, not as something bad, something exciting, something to celebrate, something to be uh, committed to, something to be alive over. That we take the frailties of our life and the frailties of other people's lives and we celebrate it instead of judge it and criticizing it. We take our dedications instead of looking at them and saying, darn it, I wish I didn't have to do this. We make our dedication to God as something, this is so important to me. This is something God's watching. This is something that will bless the Lord. Rejoicing. Wonderful subject, Sec Chronicles 15 chapter. There's this amazing king by the name of Asa. He's a reform of the king who takes place in Judah. He, like the other kings, have had bad families before him, but he does good. When the commitment that we make becomes a pleasure, it changes the whole commitment to easy instead of difficult. In 2 Chronicles, we see the life of Asa, if you will. Verse number 12 through 15. Verse 12 says it like this. Then they entered into a covenant. This is the people following Asa. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all of their heart and with all of their soul. Now look back up at me. Isn't that a cool thing? They entered into a commitment. They entered into a dedication. They entered into a time of consecration to do something. Watch this. To seek the Lord God of their fathers, with all of their heart, with all their, isn't that following? Isn't that getting rid of themselves? Making a commitment there? Now watch this. They're so committed at this. Here's what they said, verse 13. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. I mean, that's, that's, you know, you come to this church and you don't serve God, we could take you outside and kill you. That's pretty bizarre, you know that, guys? Would you say that anybody made that kind of a statement is pretty radical? Sometimes we think people are radical. That's radical, man. In other words, you can come to this church, but when you screw up, that's it, man. We're hanging you from a tree outside. That's what it's all about. Those pepper trees got big limbs just to get you. When you come here, there's four or five people, no matter how rich you are, no matter how you are, you're dead. And the reason for that, can I just say this? Because they knew the condition of the people brought everybody down. Listen to this. You talk about separation. The condition of the people brought everybody else down. If a bunch of them were allowed to keep messing around, they would pollute the rest of them and bring them all bad. And God was trying to make a statement. For us today, thank God he isn't there. 
verse 14. And when they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpets and ram's horns, now there's a commitment, it's a dedication, it's amazing. Verse number 15. And all of Judah rejoiced at the oath. In other words, when they made a dedication of their life towards something, they rejoiced over the dedication. They didn't see it as a hardship or a pain in the butt. They saw it as something wonderful. And they rejoiced over the dedication of the oath. For they had sown with their hearts and sought him with their, all of their soul. And he was found by them. And he was found by them. Listen to this, when people chase after God and they follow God with all of their heart and with all of their life and they get rid of the issues that were once holding them back to be all that God and they make a wholehearted commitment to God. Notice these words, and he was found, God was found by them. God was found by them and the Lord gave them rest all around. I mean, if there's anything that we ought to learn about dedication, there's three things. We're here to follow God. Not man, not our flesh, but really seriously be dedicated in our following of God. With all of our heart, with all of our soul. Thank God, in the meantime, while we're learning how to do this, no one's dragging us out of the building and killing us in the courtyard. We don't need to do that. That's not what this is about. The second thing we're finding out is we're not only just following God, but we're a people, if we're going to be really dedicated to the Lord, we're going to have to be people who remove these obstacles that are in our life. You know those little things that come up that keep you from being all that God would have you to be. You can't live with them and go further with God. But you can remove them by the power of God that dwells on the inside of you. Holy Spirit, and by the word of the Lord. And thirdly, the dedication you make to God ought to be a point of rejoicing. In other words, I'm happy about this. This is good. This is a celebration. Take out the horns. I'm going to serve God with all of my heart. And you know what the Bible promises? You will find him and he will bring peace in your life. And that's worth a dedication to the Lord. Come on, somebody. I'm going to make this short and sweet. Tonight, some of you are here, and if you should die tonight, you need to hear me. If you should die tonight, listen to what I'm going to say. You're going to go to hell. And that would be a real shame. And I want you to check yourself out for the next few minutes to make sure you do not go to hell. Because you don't go to heaven because you're a nice person. Did you know that most people in America think they're going to heaven because they're nice? You're not going to get to heaven. It doesn't say anything about that in the Word of God. You don't go to heaven because you say you love God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you love God, you get to go to heaven. In fact, those guys that crashed the airplane in the World Trade Centers, their last words is, we love you, Allah. According to my Bible, wrong God and the wrong way to express love. Oh, my goodness. And they're in hell today, according to my Bible. So let's don't mess around. You can't say, I love God, think you're going to go to heaven. Some of you say, wait a minute, I don't go to heaven because my mom and dad told me it's Christian. I've always thought of myself as a Christian as a kid. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible says because your mom and dad christened you or baptized you, put a religious jewelry around your neck, called you a Christian, had you christened, took you to catechism, Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. Nowhere does that get you to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Jesus says about you, listen to this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can go to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven Jesus' way. You might say to me, wait a minute, Pastor, hold on. You know, I joined my last church. It was a Christian church. I sang in the choir for years. I helped the pastor, taught Sunday school. I was a leader 
in that church. Cool. Could you show me somewhere in the Bible that says you're a, a leader in the church and help the pastor and sing in the choir? You, you get to go to heaven? Because guess what, guys? It's not there. Nope, you're not going to make it. You say, well, pastor, wait a minute. How, how, how do you get to heaven? Jesus said it just like this. No other way but his way. John 3rd chapter. Bottom line, he says it like this. You must be born again. Now, wait a minute. Did you know that most people in American churches don't know what born again means? Let me tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. It means you've given God all your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Did you, did you hear that? All your heart and all your life. Now, watch this. Watch this. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Man, I'll bet you never heard that in church before. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. You've heard of it. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. People that call, I love this, call themselves Christians are not real Christians at all if they're lukewarm because they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. What's lukewarm? Check it out. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out, little up, little down. Lukewarm token prayer, occasional church attendance. Here's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Wow. In other words, God is something in your life. Uh-huh but he's not everything, that's lukewarm, my friend. Somebody needs to tell you before it's too late. And you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. I can't do it for you. If I could, I would. But it's your heart and your life. You're going to have to give it to him. That's what he gave you, by the way, all of his heart and all of his life, didn't he? Didn't hold anything back for you only asking you to do the same. Give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Not my way, not your way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. That simple. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, denied my presence in hell. Now listen, I already know you know who Jesus is in your head. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know who Jesus is. But you can't get to heaven with head knowledge. Think about it. The devil knows who Jesus is. He's not going to heaven. It's not about you celebrating Christmas every year and Easter every year. You know who he is. But that doesn't make you a Christian. It's not about what you did with your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given God? You know why you got to give it? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you at your heart. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do this. Listen, that's what this is all about, is you understanding. You're going to have to make the call to get close to God, and God will get close to you. And like he said, and he'll bring the peace of God into your life. But you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. So here we are tonight in a safe, friendly place, man. We've sung songs. We've clapped our hands. You have great listening to the word of the Lord. We talked about, you know, interesting things about dedication. Don't miss out tonight in giving God all of your heart and all of your life. You say, well, Pastor Jim, if I raise my hand, because in a moment I'm going to count to three, I'll go like this, one, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together, bang, when you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. When you raise your hand, I'll see it. What do he say? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. Wow, you want him to do that. And so when you hear this sound, bang, your hand goes up. And what you're saying is you want to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Who should raise their hand again? You've been running from God instead of to God I'm speaking to you. You've never given him all of your heart. Come on, you know who you are. Don't mess with God. Today is your day of salvation. You're one of those people that are not sure? Make sure. 
Or maybe you prayed with Billy Graham or Harvest Crusade, but you didn't follow up the prayer with all of your heart and all of your life. Well, tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Bang, pop my hands together. You get your hand up. You say, wait a minute, if I get my hand up, Pastor, if I get my hand up, I'll be embarrassed. I'll feel funny. People I came with, they'll see me. People behind me will see me. I'll, I'll feel weird. Uh-huh, you might. Get over it. It's better to feel weird or embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on. Tonight, it's your night. Back to the family rooms, I'm talking to you. We're all across this auditorium. Are you ready? I'm counting to three. It's your call. I've done my job. All you got to do is get your hand up. Let me see it. Put it right back down. How simple is that? Are you ready to give God all of your heart? Are you ready to give God all of your life? Then this is your time to respond. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven, eight. Thank you. Nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Twelve. Back here in the family room. Anybody else? There's another one back here. Thirteen. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? You can put your hands down. I saw those. Thirteen wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Thirteen wise people. How about, is that cool? Give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? All 13 of you. Here's instructions. All 13, even from the family room, if you raised your hand back there in the family room, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. If you're serious about God, I want you to do something. If Jesus can walk down to Calvary, get beat up all the way, beaten, bloody mess, nailed to the cross for you, a public spectacle for you with people spitting at him and calling him names, then you can get out of your seat in a safe and friendly church Get in the aisle. Any one of the aisles will lead you right up here in front. I want you to get in your, out of your seat. Bring your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to bring a friend. Come on, just say to your friend, come on, go with me. Let's go. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. Come just as you are. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Here come on. The hurry, hurry, hurry. Come just as you are. Yeah, come on, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come and see. Come we see. Come and live forever. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Well, thank you guys for coming. Over here, if you look just here left, See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Okay? Two, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature about what to do next. Three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers, where we give away friends, someone that will help you get strong. You'll meet him before church service. Now, wait a minute. You said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said, and walked down the aisle in front of all these people, in front of God, and said you're going to, every demon in hell is ticked off right now because they've had you, and they have now spotted you coming forward, and they're going to try to get you back. But we're here to say no. You need to hook up with an SPT. Let us help you get strong and then you can help rescue other people. So don't just fall through the cracks, make this walk down here for nothing. Let us help you go on with God. Is that okay? The Rock Church is here for you and we love you very much. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.